A reading from the book of 1 John, verse, chapter 5, verse 13 through 21. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God in eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. This is the word of the Lord. Please. Well, continue to turn on your Bibles. Um, the text will be above me, behind me. Um, I wanted to just remind us that I've served in a couple different uh, traditions uh, denominationally, and it's interesting that uh, in different in different places, people are looking for different things. So, in, in, in a lot of times in Presbyterian churches, a lot of uh, uh, Presbyterians were kind of like just. The, the music and the that you're just pushing all that through all that to get to the sermon get, get rid of that stuff just get me to the sermon I was serving in an, um, a, a church that was a little uh, their, their sacraments were slightly heightened and so for them just pushed away the music and the, the sermon just get me to the sacrament to the point where I served in churches where people would show up just for the sermon and leave um, where people just show, show up for the sacraments and leave I was when I was in London there was a church known for fantastic music and, and I was with a group of friends, and we're all church planting, and, and they used to, one of their cell be, don't, don't really worry about the sermon or anything, just come for the music, it's amazing. Um, and so, and, and I was thinking about, if you've ever eaten, been, if you ever had the pleasure of eating wings with me, uh, you would know that, for me, the wing is not finished until there's nothing, nothing on it. Um, if you just take one bite of your wing and leave it there, I'm thinking, what a waste. If you eat all the meat, I'm still thinking, what a waste. There's more there. Um, so our goal on Sundays is not to waste your time. Uh, we are in no rush, but it is to enjoy every, every part, morsel that is offered. So we do not want to waste your time, but we do not want to hurry through the feast that is everything, especially on a Sunday, the first time of the month when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, and we have the Word, and we have music, and we have a kid's chat. I hope that your hearts are in a place where you're saying, this is great. Um, I want I want it all. There's a little barbecue sauce left. I don't want to give it up yet. Um, so hopefully your Bibles are now open. Uh, just this last week, with all this wonderful rain we've been getting, uh, we've gotten to have more time with our children because things are getting canceled. So for us, it's been fantastic. And so we decided to go to a movie. And on the way to the, I bought the tickets online, and we showed up, and everyone was dancing and happy. And we got our popcorn and our, and our drinks, and we're going into line to scan our tickets to walk in. And the scanning machine keeps saying, error. And I look at my phone, and I realize we've, I've driven my family to the wrong movie theater. And so we must hop in the van as quickly as possible and thank the Lord for a ridiculous amount of previews that we made it to the other movie theater in a different town on time. That was just in the last week. And, and as I was prepping for my sermon, that reminded me when we were in London, there was this little, about six years ago, there was a battle of the buses in London, spiritual battle of the buses. A group of the human secularists in London uh, thought it would be great if they started putting advertisements on the sides of buses. And the advertisement literally just said, it kind of came out of nowhere. So imagine you're just living your life in London and the buses everywhere all of a sudden said, literally just out of nowhere, just said, stop worrying. Uh, sorry, there's probably no God. So stop worrying and enjoy life. Um, out of nowhere. And then that kind of unified the Christians from the, the Russian Orthodox to a Bible society to, a, to a, 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 just a group of association of Christians. And so they started pouring in money, and it was kind of expensive to run it out on the bus for a day. It was like $40,000. Um, and so they ran an ad the, the following week that said, um, uh, quoted Psalm, very British, the humor's pretty good here, but Psalm 53, one which says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Um, <laughs> and, uh, 
But the, the, the question we have to look at that John's been going through this whole gospel is really, which bus have you been getting on? And that's what we're looking at. That's what he's been trying to declare to us. Um, that probably most of us have been enjoying hopping on the wrong one from time to time. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time together. We pray now, Holy Spirit, that you would come change our hearts and minds. Set them to you and to your gospel, to your message. Um, and only you can do this. So we pray that you would do that through your word this morning. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So just to, to recap where we've been, John's big premise for this book, as he told us at the beginning in chapter 1, verse 4, that he wrote this book because there's something wrong with our understanding of joy. It wasn't complete. And he's been going through all the different ways. What does joy look like? Why do we need to have it? How does it feel? What does it sound like? How do we get it? All, he's been going through to help us understand the significance of of joy, and he's been tying to it, saying that, showing us that eternal life and joy are almost inseparable. It's almost as the way John uses them is basically saying they're the same thing. Eternal life is joy, real joy is eternal life. You don't have one apart from the other. And last week we talked about how he said the, the big premise was uh, for some of you, if you need authoritative, because what was happening was there was some teaching that was starting to lead them astray. And, and not just John, but all the apostles are very clear. Any teaching that does anything to distort the message of Christ has only one use, and that's to be flushed down the toilets. And he's saying, this is happening again. And now he's trying to argue why you need to listen to him. And so he was saying, don't listen to me. We have three powerful witnesses. Um, it's kind of like if you think of a black hole. We can't actually take a picture of a black hole, but the <clears throat> evidence of them existing in the universe is there because everything is moving around them. In the same way, the evidence he pointed to, the water, the blood, and the testimony are things right now we can't physically see. We have the Lord's Supper to remind us of them, but we can't see Jesus physically. We can't see physically the Holy Spirit, but he's saying these are three powerful testimonies, three authoritative testimonies. And the big thought last week was, who are you listening to? What testimony are you listening to about life, faith, and joy? And so today, John's finishing up his book. Verse 13 says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So this is very similar to how he started the whole book. I write these things that so you, you, you would know that you would have joy and that your joy would be complete. So it sounds very similar. He's starting, he's ending where he's starting. And what we're going to look at is how um, in this text there are, he used the word know six times, but there's really five things he wants you to know. And this first one here, all the other four kind of flow off of this. Um, and to help you, I've, I've made all of these, uh, these things start with R. So if you have a list, if you'd like to write down things, you can write down uh, five R's. And I'm going to give you the five R's. But the first thing he wants us to know, again, what he's trying to do is, is undo this false teaching that seeped into us. And the problem with the false teaching is that it leads to a fool's goal. It leads to a false joy, something that is not what you really think it is. And so he's saying, I write this in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So the first one is about reassurance. He's trying to reassure you or remind you that you have eternal life. He wants you to remember that. And I was thinking about this. It's so funny he's starting there because you might think, well, what is he saying? What he's saying is, ready for this? What he's saying is, you clearly forget important things. Uh, and you might think, I don't forget important things. And I'll say, yeah, we do, all the time. You ever forgotten a birthday or a holiday or forgot something important in someone else's life? I remember a, a few years ago, um, when I was a little bit younger, in, in my 20s, um, I had an amazing uh, opportunity for an interview um, at this one particular church, and uh, it was it was a, the interview that was going to be like an hour away with someone on a committee, um, and it was for like at, at ten o'clock in the morning over coffee, and um, at ten o'clock in the morning my phone rang while I was asleep, and said, "Hey, where are you?" And I said, "Where am I?" And I realized I had, I forgot to set my alarm clock, and I slept right through the appointment, and I said, "Well, I guess." That's probably a bad first impression. <laughs> and um, didn't even bother with the second, trying to set up a second interview. And so what he's starting off with is, you have to remind yourself of the most important thing 
and that is you have eternal life. In Christ, you have eternal life. And he's going to go from there. He's going to immediately go from there to, to what this means. So now we're going to the four others. So no, remind yourself, reassure yourself. I mean, uh, yeah, reassure yourself that you have, no, re yeah, reassure yourself you have eternal life. And now he's going to say, so what does it mean when we reassure ourselves? He's basically going to say, there's four things that really kind of cop up that you, need to that you need to know. In verse 14 and 15, he jumps to first is prayer. He's like, when you remind yourself you have eternal life in Christ, there is now a connection you have to God where you can pray. And he jumps right into prayer. So here verses 14 and 15. This is very similar to John 15, 7, where he says, you can pray anything and he will hear you. And he says again here in 1 John, this. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request, the request that we have asked him. This word here um, is the same word where we get the word for acoustic, but it means, doesn't just mean to hear. It really means to understand. As one commentator pointed out, it's not just saying, God, um, we say a prayer and we, we, we hear the prayer. Um, just, just recently, one, uh, one of our children was, was screaming at the other child, and, and my wife came running around saying, do you not hear what's happening? And I looked at her saying, I, I honestly didn't. Um, they were four feet from me, and I completely tuned them out because I was trying to talk to my other kid. And she's like, how did you not hear them? I was like, I know it's a gift. I just wasn't able to, I was, I was able to completely turn it off. And what he's, the commentator is saying is it's not just God hears you as like a, you're making noise. It's that he understands what you're saying on a deeper level. He not just hears you. He understands what it is you're praying to him. Maybe just in that, it challenges you to think about how are you praying and what are you praying. When you just give him lift service, he knows, he understands what you're actually saying. When you're praying for something you want, he understands what it is you're really looking for. He understands your prayer, which is why it's so important. He says that's why you have to pray according to his will, because so many times the deeper reason what we're praying for is contrary to really what his will is. What he's saying is, Whatever you ask, if it's according to the character, the content of the word, the character of Christ, in step with where he is and what he's doing in his revealing his will, then the answer will be yes. But a lot of times they, they bump into each other. Um, there, there was a movie uh, I don't know, a decade or so ago. It was a comedy about a guy who's given the powers of God for a little bit. And he was receiving all these requests. Everyone was asking for money. And he decided, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to say yes to everybody. And so everyone who prayed for money, he gave them a yes. And what happened was countries around the world started collapsing economically because money was becoming worthless. And that was a good little example of understanding why. The problem of if we had a guy who said yes to everything, what happens when two people are requesting things that are contrary to one another? You need a God to discern what is right and good. So he's not saying that he hears you. He says, I understand what you're praying. But there's this thing, this immovable thing of his will that is working. But he's reminding us. So the second thing you need to know in verses 14 and 15, this joy, the joy, this eternal life, the first joy brings us reassurance, right? The second joy brings us self-reliance. You can put a little wink there, emoji. What he's saying is, not self-reliance on you, it's self-reliance on him. We can rely on the fact. Do you ever have someone you can actually rely on no matter what? What he's saying is, the joy that comes to you who know Christ means you can rely on the fact that when you pray, he understands what you're praying. He cares about what you're praying. We can't say that a lot about a lot of people, but we can about him. I know it's an S first, but it's self-reliance. Now, so how does this work regarding to others? So, so John says, but this prayer thing, let me give you an example. This is what he's basically doing. He says, so, so we have this, now that we have them, we can pray. And then he goes, so let's look at prayer a little more closely. And he cuts right to the heart when he does this. John Calvin, in the next two verses we're going to read, John Calvin himself said, if you don't know who John Calvin is, he lived about 500 years ago, brilliant, 
considered one of the greatest minds in thinking about theologically about Christianity as anyone who's ever <laughs> walked the earth. John Calvin, on his commentary on this passage, literally said, when it comes to discerning what he means, he's talking about, talking about sin that leads to death and sins that leads to life. He literally says, well, I'm going to let the reader decide that one. <laughs> so this shows you it's kind of a confusing thing that John's about to say, but he's cutting to the heart of what it means to truly pray. So let's read verse, um, verses 16 and 17. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. You might say, wait, where, is, what does this mean? Where, where is he going? Well, uh, one thing Calvin wanted us to know that, that in, in, at the time, especially, it's still a little bit now, but there, there's sometimes teaching the Catholic Church, other churches teach maybe there's different kinds of sin out there. And maybe John is talking about that, that there's, there's different kinds of sin he's, he's praying for. But to understand this part properly, we've got to start at verse 17. All wrongdoing is sin. But there is sin that does not lead to death. And so all wrongdoing is sin. John is making sure we understand he's not saying that. He is not saying there are sins that are, are in, in, in terms of what they do to your heart, different than other. It's not like when uh, you go to the shopping um, grocery store and you go to salsa and there's hot, medium, and mild. Um, it's not like sin is hot or medium or mild. There's just one kind of sin. It's, it's the sin that brings death. He's making sure we understand that. But so what, what is he talking about here? Well, he's actually going to flesh it out in the next couple of verses. But the first premise we need to know is that he does say unequivocally, violating any sin leads to death. There is no question about that. But we also have in John 13, 10, where Jesus himself taught that once someone has been made clean, he was washing people's feet. And, and John said, if you're going to wash my feet, Jesus, wash everything. And Jesus says, once you've been clean, the only thing you need to be washed are your feet. And what scripture is telling us there is that once you've, once you've been redeemed, once you've been um, saved, once you've been cleansed by Christ, there is no breaking that. You are clean. And so we have these passages that, that go together. And John specifically is, I think, cutting to a real-world thing. What about sin? And so if the way you look at verse 16, it really has two parts. He says, there's, what about someone who commits a sin that that's doesn't lead to death? And what about someone who commits a sin that leads to death? And really, I think what this leans more towards, in the Bible there talks about this one unforgivable sin. And, and most commentators say it sounds like that, but it's not related to that at all. That has to something to do with denying the, the Holy Spirit. Um, what this leans more towards, um, from the way that I think John was going through this, is saying, listen, if someone is in Christ, remember like a passage I quoted out of John 13, if he is clean, that doesn't mean you, you aren't going to sin. What it means is that the power over you, the power of sin over you, has been defeated. So therefore, your sin isn't going to lead to your ultimate eternal death. You're still going to go reside with Christ in the heavenlies. But there is sin. So he's saying if someone has a sin, someone who is a follower in Christ who, who is sinning, you need to pray for them that they would, that sin would be removed from their hearts. And he's talking about the, when he's saying why, why pray for the sin that for people lead to death, what he's saying is this. Why worry about the symptom if you haven't healed the cure? To those who do not know Christ, who are walking straight away from him, knowingly accepting saying, I reject him, I'm walking away. Yet at the same time, they're struggling with a part of God's holiness, following a part of his commandments. John is making it pretty clear, saying, why? Because you remember, he talks about walking light versus walking in the darkness. He's saying, walking light doesn't mean you're perfect. It means as you're stumbling, you're still moving towards Christ. But he's saying, if those, there are those and there are those who are moving away, who are moving away from Christ, who reject him. He's saying, why would you pray that a sin would be removed from them and not acknowledge the elephant in the room, that they don't know Christ? He's being very real. He's saying, again, he's talking about praying according to God's will. God is very clear. The most important thing to him is that you know him and that he is your Savior and you're becoming like him. 
And John is saying, so why would you pray that someone no longer struggle with a particular sin and ignore the fact of their real need, that they don't know Christ? That might be a little bit challenged to some of us who, who want to go the other route. I'd rather focus on the other stuff and not on the most important thing, that they don't know Christ. And so John is challenging us a little bit on that. Let's go a little bit further now. So what else? What else is this, this bringing? So this reassurance that we have life, immediately John to remind that that reassurance means you can now pray. A pray to a God who understands you. Pray bold prayers. But understand the most important what the most important thing is I understand what God's heart is like when you're praying for the people around you. And now we get to verse 18 and 19, which I think kind of go together. It says this. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. Verse 19. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So what we're seeing now in 18, 19 is actually... Uh, what's the result of the prayer that's happening in verses 16 and 17? So the first one is for what those who are in Christ. Look at it says. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep, keep on sinning. But he who has been born of God protects him. And the evil one does not touch him. What they're talking about here is that the, the joy. What does joy bring here? Your next star. It brings relief. The gospel. The joy that comes from the gospel brings relief in you trying. This performance anxiety that, that's so important to us in there that we are perfect in all ways, that we must, de we must ace every test, we must be the best in everything. When it comes to our faith, if it does not look like the best, then we want to reject it. <coughs> and the problem is it will never look that way. And so what this joy brings is relief from the pressure of having to be perfect because Christ was perfect. He was perfect on our behalf. So now when those of us who do struggle, who do stumble, who do sin, we know that what he wants is sanctification. He wants that the word that word means to become better and better. He wants us to become more like him. So we know when we can now we can pray. When someone's in Christ, it doesn't matter what it is, how far away they are falling. That means we can confidently pray. And we know God will understand us and can restore you. It's the answer to verse 16. And we talked about this, John talked about this in my sermon a couple weeks ago. What does that look like? Well, true joy looks like your capacity to now make, take the commandments of God and make them come alive in your life. To love God, to love man, to love the commandments, to love his word. Apart from joy, you will never be able to do that. But with joy, with eternal life, it can happen. Verse 19, have you ever, I don't know if you've ever done this, but uh, if you ever to travel internationally, it's fun to have um, your passport, because there are different, different countries have different lines for different, uh, different passports. And uh, sometimes the, the, if you have a passport from America, you get to jump in front of other countries. Um, because that, that country it requires no visa um, or there's just a special treaty with the countries and it reminds you when you walk through you're like that's right <laughs> I get to skip to the front of this particular line some countries you don't but when you do it's pretty powerful in verse 19 verse 19 what the joy brings here is rest he's saying we know that we are from God what this joy brings to you is a knowledge of where it is you come from and in a world that's very shaky and demands you ask the question, why am I here? In an imperfect world, you've got to look to yourself and say, what's the point of even being here? Right? Why does any of this matter? And what this joy brings to you is the answer to the question of why am I here? You were here because you were a part of his family. You were here because he made you and created you. So it brings a rest. We spend a whole sermon passage talking about 
we've been adopted in Christ. But the second part of verse 19 says this, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. That word lies actually doesn't, uh, it's not the word lie like I'm telling the truth. Lie means to actually be, be reclining in. Reclining in. The whole world is reclining in the power of the evil one, the power of the devil. What a great example why John was talking about why pray for someone who's it, 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 someone who's struggling with something if they're, they're having to acknowledge first they need Jesus. Because what he's saying is, look, what they're doing is they're reclining. <coughs> One commentator put it, that's, that's, that's what sin really is. You're resting. Instead of resting in the arms of Christ, you're resting in the arms of Satan. You're enjoying his embrace. You like what he's surrounding you with. Because he's speaking to your heart. He's giving what your heart wants versus what it needs. And that's what John is saying here. This brings you rest from having to worry about that. Because he's in control. The last, the last joy he talks about, the last thing we need to know about here is in verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his son, Jesus. Lastly, joy brings rescue. This joy we're talking about brings rescue. It rescues you from a world, from a life that is constantly making you question. Think about that opening bust. There's probably no God. There's, there's, no, there's no objective truth. There's no reason to being here. There's no eternity. So have a good day. Right? That's I mean, like you just you just cause someone to lose their whole whole all their identity, their purpose for being here, and like you know, go go have a good day. That's horrible. And what he's saying here is he's come to rescue you from that. He's here to rescue you from yourself, from the embrace, the reclining with the evil one. He's come to rescue you from that and to feel his embrace. He's come here to rescue you from the fact that you are trying, you are trying to live to your own commands. But now he's taking his commands and putting them inside your heart. He's rescuing you with his holiness. He's rescuing you with his love. He's coming to rescue you. <coughs> but the ending here is kind of interesting. Some people think maybe there was something else that maybe wasn't even, there was another chapter. It's a very, it ends very abruptly. And John's ends like this. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. His final warning. So he's written this whole whole epistle, this whole letter, to let you know that your joy, your joy should not be lost under bad teaching, whether you come up with it or someone's led you astray. And he's saying the solution to bad joy is real joy that comes from a solid foundation of knowing who Christ is and what he's done. And he boils it down to the biggest problem everyone was having was idol worship. Chasing after false gold. False gold is worth nothing when you cash it in. False joy brings you nothing when you try to cash it in this life. The opposite, if you look at those five R's, instead of reassurance, it brings discouragement. This is what idol worship does. It doesn't bring you reassurance. It brings you discouragement because it will not satisfy you. Instead of self-reliance, it brings you distrust because whatever you're hoping is going to let you down. It does not bring relief, but it brings disappointment, especially in yourself. Your idol is going to remind you that you need more. You need something different. You want whatever it is. You're not, you're not filled. It's not going to bring rest. It's going to bring distress. Your heart will not be at ease. And finally, it will not bring rescue. It'll bring danger. This is what idol worship does. So if you could describe your faith with those words that start with D, then I would encourage you to think that maybe you are not embracing the joy, the eternal life that Jesus Christ is offering. If you see that you have more of those R's, you want more of those R's, you need to see that those R's are only found in Jesus Christ. Reassurance, reliance on him, relief, rest, rest. <coughs> Those are the words that describe what Christ is bringing to us. 
So in your workplace, in your homes, the message of Christ that you're bringing with you to those around you, is it pulling out of them rest and rescue? Or is it bringing up discouragement and distrust? Your goal should be help bring the true joy that Christ is talking about, the eternal life that Christ is talking about, the ability to love God, love others, and love his commands that all come from being united to him. We're about to celebrate the sacraments, which again, testify that Christ has done this and that he is real. So the last question, what bus have you been riding on? Are you trying to cash in that fool's gold? Are you on the bus that leads to true joy? Or on the bus that leads to eternal danger? Christ is saying there's only one way to get on. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, your book here was about joy. This epistle was about joy. And you told us that joy looks like loving you so much that it looks like we hate everyone else. Loving people around us, loving the brothers and sisters in Christ so much that people are jealous of it. And loving your commandment so much that we're willing to forsake anything to follow them. And all these things don't bring you to us. These are all a result of you coming to us. This is what true joy looks like. Eternal rest. Eternal rescue. Lord, I pray that we be reminded of you and all we say and do. You remind us that you are real and that we may trust you. Lord, take our joy and make it real. In the name of our Son, Jesus Christ, we pray all these things. Amen. Amen? Amen. Thanks, guys. We want to now move to...